<laughs> and I said, sure, I will do this. And um, of course, he gave me that sustainment. That kind of made sense, because I am the director of contracting for the sustainment center. But his cleverness also was where he placed me in the cycle. First, he put me at this point where I was following everybody else, so I could leverage off everybody else. Because he knows Tony in time, and actually, Kyle Herring from Robbins told me, I saw you're on for a 45-minute speech, and I said, yep. He said, you've never done anything in 45 minutes. <laughs> and I said, well, that's true. And in fact, I put a, I put a briefing chart, because most people who know me also know I don't like to do briefing charts. But I have briefing charts here. It's 42 slides, and in three minutes of slides, I have two hours for you, which means I promise to be done by my appointment 1035 time. <laughs> Actually, the slides are there because I did the research that we often don't have time to do, and it actually builds on what some of the other folks have done. There's a lot of material, and in some of it, there's actually notes behind it, because you'll get copies of the slides in case you didn't know that. And then you have the opportunity to go in and say, oh, how do I connect to that? But what he also did is he put me here so I can leverage off of his MBS. Dr. Roper mentioned sustainment, so he talked about how big it is. Heidi talked about the aging Air Force, right? Allie did a great thing, right? And she talked about, you know, how do we all connect with it? So we'll do that. Um, I want to start with that and say, oh yeah, there's one other thing he did put me on here too. Um, he knew that at the end of it, you'd be so finished with me being up here that you'd be excited to have Pat never talk about that. <laughs> so it's very clever, very strategic. All right, so everyone in here who believes that in their contract mission set, they are doing sustainment for the Air Force. Please stand up. That's your stretch. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Look around. So let's applaud all those people who do sustainment. <laughs> now let's all sit down. I'm going to give you a slide, please. And the next one. So this is what Webster says sustainment is, right? You are sustaining, and sustaining is keeping up, prolonging, nourishing, right? Next slide. This is what DOD says it is. Providing logistics and personnel services, maintaining and prolonging operations until mission accomplishment, right? Include supply, maintenance, logistics, hey, operational contracting support. So how many people didn't stand up? Sustainment isn't just the sustainment center. Sustainment is what we do, whether I'm sustaining facilities and infrastructure, whether I'm sustaining combat capability, whether I'm sustaining personnel, we all do sustainment. Now, I am going to focus on the Air Force Sustainment Center part of it, and I'm going to try to bring that back, because you'll find out that sustainment is done by those life cycle organizations, by those new weapons organizations, by those installation organizations. Every day you are doing sustainment. Next slide. And the next. So I'm going to introduce you to who we are. The Sustainment Center, you know AFMC put six centers in there, right? And they did put sustainment in one of those. And that's the core mission of the Sustainment Center, which is why it is called such. Next slide. It's located in 26 different places, 18 states, two different countries, 43,000 people doing sustainment. In fact, something you probably didn't know, um, all those guys who have people in support sciences, scientists and engineers, right? You know who has the most scientists and engineers in the Air Force, right? The Sustainment Center, over half of them. Interesting, huh? A lot of that's because they do software maintenance, right? And they actually do software development. It's no longer software maintenance, it is software development. Okay, so there's the location of the footprint. Next slide. What they're most built around is the depots, the complexes, the air logistics complexes. They turn out 700 aircraft, 400 engines, 300,000 commodities, 750 software products, 6 million hours every year to sustain this Air Force, to sustain the weapon systems that keep this Air Force ready and lethal. Next slide. In addition to those complexes, they have these supply chain management wings. So those wings do both the retail side and the wholesale side. So they are wholesale buying and maintaining, using not just us, but our DLA partners to keep the supply chain in spare parts and repaired parts, whether they're going into the depot or they're going out to the user. The 635th actually is the retail side which when you're talking about pushing forward so we can be out there and ready and we can be lethal at the site, they're the ones that distribute all those parts, all of those needed supplies. Next slide. The airbase wings, so we cannot overlook, cannot overlook the importance of the installations. They stood up installation management support command, right? Sensor, which is doing 
most of the bases. AFMC still has its bases, and within the sustainment center, we can't deal without these folks taking care of what goes on. It's the CE of those organizations that keeps that depot in its facilities, right? It keeps it ready to be able to do its mission set. Can't do it without them. They're the ones that actually do working for our deployment, for all our readiness stuff. That every swing is critical. Next slide. So where are our goals and how does it fit? You heard the themes of readiness and modernization, readiness and lethality, right? So that is where AFSC is built around, right? I'm readiness with respect to providing combat capability, turning out those weapon systems, and I have readiness issues with the supply chain being ready so that we can persecute or prosecute or prevent a crisis because it's not about fighting a war but being ready to fight a war if we have to. There are mission enablers like that infrastructure, so that infrastructure is critical, critical. And uh, we're going to talk, and what I'm going to talk as I get really into uh, the latter part of this and focus on how we are modernizing the Air Force. Notice everyone, and everyone should always focus on that last bullet, right? If anybody doesn't have that as one of their critical elements, focusing on building and developing airmen, and that's airmen. It doesn't matter whether you're in uniform or you're out of uniform. You talk to the sustainment center, it's the contractors that support us too. We all are airmen in that grand scheme of giving capabilities to the Air Force. Yay, Mo. You were there. Next slide. Okay. I want to talk the challenges on the fleet, and this is just data. I'm going to quickly pop some slides. And I'm going to do this because Heidi said a good thing yesterday to tell you how old it is, right? I mean, that B-52, I'm going to make the t-shirts and make, did you ever see Forrest Gump? Everybody saw Forrest Gump, right? The guy wiped the mud off his shirt, right? And he made a fortune off of it. My fortune is going to be a B-52 on a walker. <laughs> it's going to be 100 years old, 100 years old, and it's still going to be dropping bombs on target. And that's because my folks at Tinker, on my LCMC side, are working with the, with the right pack folks, OTs, to do the front end of it. It's an 804 rapid acquisition, right? It's gonna re-engine the entire fleet. And this gentleman here, believing authority gets pushed down, push me the business clearance on the four million dollars and million and a half, billion, four billion dollar one buy, billion and a half other buys, or whatever they end up being, right? He's giving me the authority to do the business clearance there. That's pushing authority down to being empowered, right? So that's good. Um, you saw something on General Spacing's chart, and it's this thing that, in fact, before I even set it up, I want everybody in this room, just so we get a perspective on it, one more stand up and then I'll let you stay down. Who was born 1985 or later? Come on. I know there's a bunch of kids in the audience. Okay. That 1980. This 1985 or later, you can go ahead and sit down because that's 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 tomorrow, right? right? So I know you were confused a little bit when General Spacey called this thing called Desert Storm <laughs> because you were kids are not even born when there's thing called Desert Storm existed, right? So that was arguably um, that, and then in 2003, the major conflicts we've been in, com uh, the fights that we've been in uh, most recently. But what I want to tell you is I'm going to give you some comparisons here of what it was then and what it was now that augments what, what, uh, what Heidi did. And all of this stuff is open source data, okay? So you can find it, you can Google it, but I did it for you. It gives you the why, and we can never forget the why of what we do, why it's important to sustain, why it's important to modernize. Next slide, please. This is our fighter fleet, and there's a whole bunch of information on there. How many of those aircraft were built? How many of them exist today? When were they built? So you understand the age of the fleet, and that goes into Heidi's information. The mission capable rate is a thing that's a challenging. Now, this is a this is a thing that is um, a, a, a data point, if you will, that is constantly going to change. So um, I didn't even put a time on this thing because it's going to change. Uh, it was only current as the time as I pulled it off pulled it off the internet. But I wanted to compare it to Desert Storm. Note our fighter fleet, that's half of what it was. Note that we put over 550 aircraft in Desert Storm out of those 4,000 to prosecute that. And that was not one of our near peers that we're gonna have to deal with in the future, right? Right? Look at the availability rate. Right now we're talking about a mission capable rate of 49 to 75% on that aircraft fleet, right? Now you know why there's that initiative out there saying MC80, how do I get mission capability to 80? The aircraft we sent to war have to be ready to prosecute war, and it was 95% when I was prosecuting Desert, War, Desert Storm. 
Okay? Think about that. 49% from my big fifth gen aircraft, right? My most current one. And that's what I'm going to need against my near peers. 95% what I delivered that day. Bomber fleet's next. Next slide. Lean heavily on the B-52. You realize that's a 1955 design airframe first delivery, and we built over 700 of them. There are 75 left in inventory. We had a bomber fleet of 400 back in the Desert Storm time frame. We have 157 we rely on today. Thankfully, that um, B-21 is going to be coming on board, right? We talk about how many we need. When that B-21 comes on, the plan is retiring B-1s and B-2s, right? So that's why that B-52 as a platform is going to be out here, and we have to sustain it and keep it modern out until 100 years old. 100 years old. Look at the mission capable rate. Right now that B-52, that's our backbone, is 72%. It was 81% in Desert Storm when we relied on it to drop a lot of bombs. Next slide. Tanker fleet, gas cans, 600 of a Desert Storm, 462. The workhorse is the KC-135. KC-46 is coming on, and they're looking at producing you know, close to 180 of the KC-46s at this point. That said, we still have half of the KC-135s that we built that were first introduced in 1957, half of them in existence. I couldn't find data on the availability of the fleet that we have, but you see those KC-135s carry the burden in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Desert Storm. Right now, there's 73% availability. So let's do the math here. If I needed 300 planes for the Desert Storm Engagement, and I have 462, and I do three fourths of that 462, can I deliver 300 planes again? That's 50%, and I'm at 73% to do the rest of the mission, assuming I have the same level of engagement. It is tough. It is tough. Next slide. Cargo aircraft. We're going to rob this folks. They got a great picture of the C-132 with the big band-aids around it because that thing has gone on another 1950s airframe, right? Except for those J models, which Tom Robinson and those LCMC folks bought back in the 90s, right? The strategic airlift is the important thing because they employed 90% of the C-5s and 80% of the C-141s that they had in the fleet in Desert Storm. They needed that strategic airlift capability to project forward, right? So I'm leaning on the C-17s. Fortunately, that's the newest and that's the one that has the greatest availability. The Robbins folks and the Boeing folks really taking a good job of sustaining that aircraft. That said, I had 1,800 mobility assets. Now, those 568 up above are not the totality of the mobility assets because there are other things that play into it. But you know what? Those are the heavy lifters. Those are our strategic and then our, our, our short mobility stuff. That's the stuff we rely on most. You kind of get the picture. Next slide. This is what's happening with those old aircraft. This is the challenges. The structures get old. The electronics get old. Heat. UV rays. Everybody know why you change your car tires at about a five or six year mark? Sometimes because you drove the wheels off of them. Sometimes it's because the sun deteriorated and it starts cracking on the side. How many people have cracks in the dash on their windshield on their, on their car? <laughs> So I have aircraft that are getting out here dealing with the elements, right? So I have to figure out, A, how to take care of that, and hopefully in the process, how to make better. Not just bringing additional capability, but making it better to do it. And what the sustainment center tries to focus on is, how do I take those aircraft, in the process of them, flow them through faster, flow them through with less cost? So I'm doing two things. One, I'm enhancing readiness. That KC-135, they turn them in 150 days out of the depot, okay? Right now, this year, they're working at about 136. The last three years, it's averaged about 150. But a few years ago, it was about 250. And they brought it down, right? That's what the sustainment center is doing in modernizing its processes, in modernizing all of its approaches, in modernizing its facilities to be able to do this. Next slide. Here's another thing that is really wild. It's a, it's a, it's a sustainment center capability. Think about software, the evolution of it. How much is growing? The doubling of software imports. F-16, great aircraft, right? 900, some of them in our fleet, right? We're slapping them. We're going to have them for a long time. 300,000 software lines of code. Look at that F-35 and look at that KC-46. Software is what's driving those weapon systems, which adds the complexity, adds the challenges to maintain them. 
And consequently, there's an organic core capability that leverage with our contractor, with our industry counterparts, is giving us the ability to not only maintain that software, but to develop those profiles. Next slide. All right, now I'm gonna talk specifically about the sustainment center and those types of things that it is going to modernize. Okay, where is it putting its focuses? What are some of the things that are being introduced, not just the sustainment center, but Air Force? As you can see when you see the last one, how global that is. Next slide. So first, have to modernize the facility. You look at those depots, they're old. Look at the equipment in it, it's old. There's two and a half billion dollars that's out there that needs to be uh, in requirements, but fortunately more FSRM money has gone in. We're working on the types of things to upgrade and maintain those facilities. Every year we spend $150 million in capital investment, whether I'm putting in an engine cell, whether I'm building a lab capability, Regardless, I am putting new equipment and expenditure to modernize those facilities. I'll bet you the IMSC people will say that's happening across every one of their bases where they're making those investments. And that's how all of us, everybody who's got an operational mission, right? You're out there taking care of your bases, regardless of what's on them. And on my bases, they're taking care of those depots in a huge way. Second is the supply chain and the delivery mode of it. They want 80% asset availability on $14 billion worth of enterprise. So they have to get more modern in how they know where the stuff is and what they're doing. I have to have capability as a system. It's log C2 to give you visibility in the supply chain so that we enable that. You know the guys are doing this log C2 and this escape thing? Guess where they are? Anybody in here from uh, Alabama? Oh, woo -hoo. I'm not talking about lower Alabama, I'm talking about Alabama. So in the middle of Alabama, in the middle of Alabama, they buy business systems, right? And they're the ones working with us on the log C2 and the escape. So we have asset availability and we have better predictability on it. So those of you who are over in Montgomery, you're working sustainment, whether you knew it or not, okay? Uh, LRU redesign, we have sustaining engineering money in the supply chain. So a lot of that LRU redesign, uh, one of them is the uh, pods down at Rogers. They have the AOQ 181 and 134 pods. They're actually taking those under sustainment contract, marrying them together, capability of both in a single pod, in the, in the one carcass. They're taking the 181 carcass, pulling the 134 stuff and marrying them together in a sustainment modernization and increased lethality way. Pretty cool, huh? different than we've done before. Two pods now go into one. Next slide. Modernizing processes. AFSC runs on a management of philosophy that's constraints-based management. You'll hear it called art of the possible. But the idea is to map your processes, figure out your process flow, figure out your throughput, identify your constraints, and go after them. In the process of this, they saved over two and a half billion dollars on their production side. Money's back to the Air Force since FY13. And they continue to do that. And they do that by driving down hours. When you're spending six million hours a year, if you figure out how to do it faster and how to do it more smartly, right? You're gonna end up yielding results, time and money back to the Air Force. Sounds kind of like a flight plan, doesn't it? I think. Okay. Modernizing technology. This is what's really cool, is you're taking the new techniques out there and you're figuring out how can I become more predictable? Anybody ever heard of condition-based maintenance, CDM plus? Kind of cool stuff. You heard Dr. Roper talk about 140 algorithms, right? Right, that's in the B1, there's 40 of them in the B1, there's 100 of them on the C5, that's where they're deploying this right now, doing CDM. Predictive analytics, now I know when it's gonna fail and I can get it before it fails or I can prevent it from failing, right? Great tool. Laser deep paint. My Ogden folks. That F-16 production line out there is using laser deep paint. You know what laser deep paint does? How many people, uh, all right, so guys or ladies, how many people ever use sandpaper? Yep, you all use sandpaper. Kind of wears down that surface, doesn't it, stuff? Laser deep paint. Preserves that surface a little better too, right? Even gets more interesting when you got to figure out how to deal your stuff on composites and how to do it on those fifth gen aircraft because of those coatings, right? Laser deep paint, robotics. 
I talk about the software, I talk about the growth on it. At the end of the day, we want to own the technical baseline. Biggest fear, I think, in the sustainment center when I'm running weapon systems to 100 years is, will that company be there to support it then? Have I bought the data? I made a lot of decisions in the 90s, not necessarily to buy that data, right? And I'm paying for it today. So I have to figure out, how do I get past that? How do I modernize the way I think? And how do I build that capability in to arguably deliver increased readiness, yesterday's topic, and the lethality that comes with it because it's enhanced with today's topic? Next slide. I'm going to talk about innovation centers. I'm going to run through some slides. I will tell you these slides, I'm not going to go detail on them. There are great notes on them, and I encourage you to do it because you'll see the types of things they're really doing, where those are growing. Next slide. It is a concept that is looking to bring agile manufacturing and technologies and capabilities into our enterprise to generate innovative solutions rapidly. Okay? Next slide. Development is that real key because that reverse engineering capability that they have, they're literally able to take parts, decode them, if you will, whether I'm talking about software that I'm decoding or whether I'm talking about an item that I'm taking it all the way back to what it is. It's about scans, it's about measurements. The tools today are amazing. I can recreate, and I do that with additive manufacturing. At Tinker, there are, there are um, 3D printers. In a React Center, you'll see that slide in a minute. It's called a React Cell, Reverse Engineering and Critical Tooling. They'll use that laser, that um, additive manufacturing, those 3D printers, to print tooling that they need special to get into something that they don't have anything on. To make a mold of something that they can't get out of supply that they can then take and with that mold actually recreate the part and print the part. Whether you knew it or not, there's already additive parts flying uh, in air certified uh, applications, but there are 3D printed parts flying on aircraft today. And it's all because people are thinking ahead and figuring out how do I modernize how I do my methods. Uh, the intellectual property is huge, that fourth one, second bullet down there. Uh, we actually hired on an individual, he'll be on, I think, in another month or so, a lawyer with IP background. I think he makes eight in the Air Force. There's like seven, because they haven't invested in it. And we're gonna go tackle those. Where do we have rights and where do we don't? Where do we not? And I'm telling you, I'm, you think I'm tired now. I think I'm tired now. In 2020, God, we're gonna be running hard. Because we're gonna go back. We actually are working with the supply chain to say, hey, why don't I go out and take all these companies to tell me they have this capability, whether it's reverse engineering, which some it is, and whether it's manufacturing. And um, I give them a couple parts and say, reverse it, create it. Because right now, what do I do with the supply chain? Anybody ever heard of the SAR, source approval, right? How do I become a government supplier? Well, I go out and spend my money, and I make this part, and I put it into you, and you test it. And you know what comes out of that? Well, it could be this, but you're successful as this, and guess what? You got the grand prize for that investment, the right to compete and make that part. So why don't I use OTs and develop prototypes, roll that prototype to production, guarantee some production like the Great Engine Wars did for payback in the sustained industrial base, buy the data at the same time, so that at the end of that production guarantee, what can I do? I have a data package, I have at least two qualified sources, and now I've reestablished the industrial base. Is that a different archetype? It's a different approach, right? It's different than what we've done because we relied on industry to do it. We have the tools now, all we have to do is put the brain power together. So right now they're looking at a sustainment consortium and going out, they've had the interface with the industry, and you're going to see that stand up probably by the end of this fiscal year, and you're going to see us write in OTs, and I've already, yes, given agreements, officer warrants, and Tinker Air Force Base. So yes, we're heading in that direction. At the end of the day, i got to sew all that together, whether it's government, it's OEM, it's industry. What I'm trying to talk to the industry guys is, you know, quit fighting about data and start collaborating with me and work on licensing and work on you getting shared benefit out of it. I'll pay you a little, little 2% royalty, and if it's four, I want half of it to go back into reinvestment for modernization, by the way. 
but I'll pay you a royalty on it and we quit arguing about it so we don't go through the expensive legal fight because at the end of the day, the weapon system has to be sustained for a long time. And I'd rather see your resources in industry work toward new products. So anyway, thinking difference. Next, next slide. So again, you see that bottom line is what I'm going to focus on. There's an organic capability, but it really builds on the partnerships too. So it's across academia and across the OEMs. Next slide. At Robbins is called the React Cell. Oh, yeah, one slide first. Sorry. Those are the capabilities. The technologies, the materials, the reverse engineering, the big capability. I'm telling you these things exist in the innovation centers that are created at each one of our locations, each one of the three locations. If you didn't know that sustainment center is where? Tinker's the headquarters. Robbins Air Force Base, Hill Air Force Base. By the way, what's cool about those locations is I have partner centers from AFMC at all of those. I have four centers at Hill. Test, Nukes, and LCMC are there. Nukes and LCMC are at Tinker, and LCMC is at Robbins. So happy family. When Tom Robbins is talking about managing personnel across all those in those locations, yeah, we do that with a corporate resource board, and we grow them all. So if anybody's wanting to come to the sustainment center, you're not necessarily coming to the sustainment center, you're coming to a location where we can give you a ton of stuff. There's my recruiting pitch. So. Sorry, Tom. We're always in. Yeah, <laughs> they can always. Next slide. Robbins has the, has the has, let's say, okay, this one's Robbins. It has the rearm cell, right? They focus on avionics and electronics. Next slide. And one of their most significant things that they've done is their partnerships with some of the local universities. They actually, at Georgia Tech, are involved with the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute. Actually are part of their, arguably, a consortium that they do, and they're all leveraged in. That's where they get introduced to people like Delta Tech Ops, which you'll see on one of the RCS slides. Uh, next slide. It's the React Cell at Tinker, and I told you that's the reverse engineering and critical tooling. It's focusing principally on additive manufacturing. So you're looking at a lot of the materials types, right? Next slide. These are the types of things they've done. We have parts on the B1, the E3, and the KC-135 that have been created through additive manufacturing. They're flying on those aircraft right now. Okay. Next slide. It is the um, Reclaim. They fo focus on composites, low observable technologies, because that's where our two fifth gen fighters are. Right? That's where those program offices are. So they're partnering, next slide, with, say, the F-22 SPO to prototype solution sets for them using their capabilities, working with materials and bringing them. Next slide. Now here's a cool one. And I'm putting this out there because it says sustainment. In it. And this is an Air Force thing, because you know who leads the Rapid Sustainment Office? Shout out. LCMC. You know who else plays in the RCO as, or as part of that, uh, the RSO as part of that um, um, board of directors, if you will? AFSC, our AFRL compatriots, right? We're all in there. And, you know, I think it was just my sustainment center people that maybe stood up when I said stand up on sustainment. But you're all playing in the uh, sustainment office, right? All right, let's talk about that. Next slide. They knew they had a problem, how to get technologies in, how to do it rapidly. Their answer was, focus on this thing. If you don't know, if you haven't read anything on it, right now it's a two-year pilot. Will it go permanent? Oh, yeah. Why? Because it is a modernization in the way we act, the way we think. It's a modernization approach to deliver modernized capability to the Air Force. Next slide. Airworthy sustainment capabilities. Get them tested, get them filled. Reduce costs, improve readiness. Where's that money go? Back into capability, back into readiness, back into sustainment. Next slide. This is their process, right? So they're really looking at experimenting to identify what they need. I've heard experimentation somewhere before, right? LOE3. They are experimenting. And then they're taking it and scaling these technologies. Where can they put it into the Air Forces without it? Where can I apply it? Whether I'm talking about my facilities, whether I'm talking about my weapon systems. Next slide. Here's some of the things in these next four slides, five slides, are the types of technologies. I talk about additive manufacturing. You see it's on B1 thing, or B2 thing, C5 things. I talked it on my slide of the React cell on B1 stuff and E3 stuff. 
polymer materials, metal printing. It's really cool what you can do with a 3D printer. Anybody seen a 3D printer? They're kind of, you've seen them operate? Because they're kind of cool. If anybody knows Daryl Davis, and he's my easy eye at Tinker. He has a 3D printed bow tie. Daryl Park wears bow ties all day long. All of them look 3D printed, but this is really 3D printed. And that's Daryl every day. He wore it to one of our meetings, so when we were meeting and talking about, about those. Uh, they actually stood up AM capability. This is something that's kind of cool. Um, um, the RSO is really sponsored this out. Those those advanced technology and training centers. AFRL and LCMC really push forward doing those, and they have them in all three locations. Right? Actually, there's there's multiple ones around the country. You see the see the mark. There's about seven of them. Next slide. Cold spray, another materials based, right, to put coatings on. They're using it in panels and tubes, and again, the technology centers have that cold spray capability in them. Why do they have those technology centers? That's where you're going to go and you're going to test it and you're going to experiment. And then you're going to figure out how to scale it up. Next slide. CDM Plus, I mentioned it before. There's the algorithms, right? C5, B1. Trying to do cloud, right? Cloud environment for development. Now everybody can collaborate at that OEM level, at that government level, out of my innovation centers, and basically make a community of interest that solves these collective these problems collectively. Next. We talked about the lasers. You have a couple different lasers on there, right? Laser technology is going to be huge. Watch it as it develops. Some people are talking about the need for lasers, not just in operations that we do, but even from a defensive perspective, as you talk about how do I counter hypersonics. Technology coming. You're going to have the opportunity here to start figuring out how these things work on different scales within what the RSO is going to do. Next slide. Delta Tech Ops. There's this company out there called Delta, right? And Delta is an amazing, amazing company. Their headquarters, their major, major principal operations are up in Atlanta, Georgia. So right up the road a couple hours from Robbins Airplane Patch. Those guys, in partnership with Georgia Tech Research, are looking at how Delta does its commercial practices toward maintenance, their processes, how they measure reliability, even in conjunction with what Robbins is doing with uh, their innovation center, digital scanning tools for services, right? Which is really going to be huge on, on fifth gen stuff. Okay? They're working with Delta and figuring out using the C5, which, oh, by the way, Lockheed Marietta right up the road, C5. What a partnership to bring together and figure out how do I take those commercial technologies and modernize our Air Force? Makes perfect sense of the cargo world. Perfect sense of the cargo world. Next slide. Okay, I'm not that <laughs> Imagine that. JT told me that if I went very long, that he was ready because he has a bowl of candy there. And he was sure that he was lethal in his aim. So JT's going to be throwing stuff at me, so I'm not going to take long. But I left one thing out of modernization. I talked about facilities, I talked about the weapon systems, right? I talked about the processes. What did I leave out? People. The thing we have to modernize that I think is one of the most important things, and there are a lot of aspects that get us there, but it's our thinking. Business as usual. It's easy, right? Easy to do business as usual. I'm comfortable with it. I'm very comfortable with it. But I have to think differently. We heard about Bloom's, ta uh, Bloom's taxonomy, right? And we talked about how we learn. And we're going to get everybody up there to where they're applying. And we're going to get probably everybody into that analyze. And we're going to get quite a few people into that evaluate. And we're going to get some people into the create if we do nothing. Because that's just going to happen. Right? Because we have a good training program. We're going to get you in there. We have great opportunities to work. We all need to rapidly go through that Bloom's taxonomy, right? And we have the opportunity today, if you listen to General Cameron Holt, if you listen 
to Dr. Will Roper. And you think about those philosophies, and it's changing the way we think. And we can all get up to that create envelope, and that's where we need you to be. We need to modernize how we do business, and the tools are getting even more and more pervasive, although some of them have existed. Tom showed you the toolbox we have today. You know, a lot of those things aren't new, because I did OTs on Global Hawk and Lake Pat and the Recon Spoke back in 1998, 1999. Okay? OTs have been around for a long time. We're talking about the opportunity to expand that thinking of what we do and learn how the application of those tools can be, right? And now modernize the way we approach enabling the Air Force not only to be ready, yesterday's topic, but again, modern and illegal, today's topic. If we don't modernize our thinking, if we don't embrace the opportunity that General Holt, and Dr. Roper are empowering us with today, we will fail the Air Force. We will not be able to make it ready to do its mission, which is to fly, fight, and win. It's been a pleasure, and it's not even 10.35. Should I stop? <laughs> Thank you, sir. And I believe the coffee and tea bar is ready, so we're going to adjourn for a 20-minute break. It'll be back at 10:20. Thank you. <laughs>